My guest today is Brian Nozick, professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia, a co-founder of Project Implicit, a multi-university collaboration for research and education investigating implicit cognition, thoughts and feelings that occur outside of awareness or control, and co-founder of the Center for Open Science that operates the Open Science Framework, enabling open and reproducible research practices worldwide. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, David. So first question, have there been any non-replicated results in psychology that have actually impacted the world outside of the academic discipline of psychology? So, you know, the example that I think of is if like we found out radio waves didn't work the way we thought, a lot of stuff would break soon, uh, that would impact the world and that would be a real big deal. Uh, has there been an equivalent kind of, you know, real, some of the reverberations outside of the academic community that you found? There have been a number, uh, although not as dramatic as something that uh, we think is being used in practice productively and suddenly right. we realize it doesn't work. It doesn't quite happen that way. Uh, but there's certainly areas of psychology that have gained popular attention and right. even efforts to translate into practice that now have gotten a lot more additional scrutiny of, is this really something? Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a simple, and then there's a hard answer to that question. The hard answer, hard version is the right version, but the simple one I'll say first, which is there's a few that got particular attention on challenges for replicability. Uh, one is the idea of ego depletion, that willpower is like a muscle in the same way that we can get ourselves physically tired and need time to recuperate our muscles in order to be able to do more physical things. Our willpower may act like a muscle, where if we engage a lot of self-control, then we lose the ability to control ourselves for a little while until it recuperates. Very appealing idea, lots and lots of research around that idea, lots and lots of potential applications. And some of the key findings several years ago failed to replicate and became a very hot area of debate. Mm -hmm. Uh, a second one, just to put a couple on the table, uh, is the idea of uh, social priming, that we are awash in uh, things happening in the world that may highlight particular ideas in our heads, uh, and just those subtle things that activate a concept may then have lots and lots of consequences for how we end up behaving consequently. Now, that's a very vague way of stating it. Some of the grounded demonstrations of that that have come under scrutiny are examples like making people think of words associated with the elderly causes them to walk slower afterwards compared to if they hadn't had those concepts primed in their heads. Or metaphorically, sitting next to a box causes people to think of more creative uses of a novel object as compared to sitting inside the box okay. because they're, they're working outside the box. Okay. So, yeah, there's some laughter there because that's like, no, that's crazy. But that is a published study showing that from the, the heyday of the priming literature uh, that such things could happen. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there because that's part of the simple stories. Wow, here's two big concepts that seemed uh, seem from replication efforts to be difficult uh, to observe again. The, the thing that I'm kind of interested in, you know, as you're talking there, and some ideas it, it, it seem ridiculous, right? And some ideas seem intuitively appealing. Uh, and I'm curious about how the conversation inside, like the whatever you call it, the lunchroom or something at lunch amongst yeah. academics progresses here because you know i had this um i just did this podcast with tyler cowan recently and and one of the things that i do as a non-academic in studying these ideas which i do on my own time because i'm fascinated by them is i read literature uh, and yeah. uh, i read quite a lot of it uh, on google scholar uh, and i'm interested in your talks about preprints and the rest of that because that's mostly what i read <laughs> um but the, the thing that i don't have access to is a network of academics that I can talk to, we you know, knock ideas around with. And what right. Tyler said to me was disappointing to me because he said, well, that's actually how learning happens. <laughs> I mean, you can read all the papers you want, but really, you know, we train ourselves by interacting physically with people, 
right? Yeah. And so we enrich yeah. that communication channel between first rate thinkers. And that's, that's actually how we figure this stuff out. We don't read papers and sit around and think about it for a while and come up with a new paper. And so I'm wondering if like what your take is on the impact that this replication uh, project has on the conversations like did academics kind of not really buy the ones that weren't replicating uh, or and so not really care and this sort of this weird thing is just going on on a sideshow nobody cares about or, or how impactful has this been to, to how academics actually think and learn if Tyler's right yeah what I think the replication movement did on this uh, issue is turn you know, backroom conversations into shared conversations. Interesting. So, for example, I mentioned the elderly slow walking study. This is from a classic paper, 1994, or 1996, right as I was entering grad school. Uh, this paper came out demonstrating th this effect. And everybody's, you know, like, that's amazing that you could prime these subtle ideas and have these consequential behaviors, like how fast someone walks, affected as a consequence. And so that opened up all kinds of new possibilities of how we might be being primed with lots of different things and what consequences that might have. But what would happen in the conduct of research was, you know, our lab uh, was relatively close in terms of uh, personnel and personality and social connections to the other labs that have done the, or were doing related work. And one of my colleagues in my lab, another grad student, tried to replicate that finding like in 1997 and was not able to obtain the result. Huh. So of course she says, oh, well, I must have screwed something up, right? Because what do I know? This is so goes to the next conference, you know, talking with people at the bar, and somebody else from another lab says, oh, yeah, I couldn't get it either. Huh. And then, you know, a couple of years later, someone else says, oh, yeah, I, I couldn't get that either. You know, we tried like three different ways. And all of that's happening, wow. but in a very small group, right? So that paper's having dramatic effect. It's spawning all kinds of research. And there is a small cluster of social, close social networking where people are saying, wait a second, this is hard. And and never actually coming to, so therefore it's false sure. or whatever, but rather this is this is more complicated than it seems. But all sort of behind this very subtle. Once the replication became a social thing in the field with these efforts to replicate prominent findings and then the media uh, scrutiny of that those conversations became very public. Lots of people said, oh, yeah, I had that problem. Oh, yeah, I had that. No, and it's like, oh, my gosh, it's everywhere. Uh, <laughs> so what do we try? <laughs> well, what do we do? So I, I think there is a very strong element of Tyler's point that is accurate, which is much of the advancement in understanding and direction is via informal social networking, whether it's in-person, face-to-face conversation, but, but really just more outside of the paper itself. Papers are benchmarks, they're little tools that we use to communicate, but so much more communication happens uh, in the community as a community. You, you wrote an interesting paper recently, uh, which was titled, uh, We're in this together, where you talked about how in the, I think it was social priming, there were two yeah. kind of schools of thought, we can say this, and um, they just, it, they didn't talk to each other. So like, you know, we, the way I imagine idealistically wrongly, I guess, is we have this body knowledge out there of the corpus of all academic published work, as it appears to me as a Google scholar aficionado, and yeah. I can look at papers that cite each other and I can follow the chains of citation and I can learn more about the state of the art yeah. of a particular idea than I could. And eventually the academic process is going to resolve itself into a fewer number of more accurate ideas over who knows, tens of years, generations. Yeah. Um, but it seems like they can sometimes these groups can splinter off and keep going down a path <laughs> on their yeah. own. And so yeah. it's like a, it's like a, you know, it's kind of like uh, there's this thing in t technology, Conway's law. You ship the org chart, right? It's like it was somehow we've we've represented the social network within the academic literature uh, interlinkages, um, and and that makes me pessimistic that papers do anything different than just represent social connections between people. Can you talk yeah. me out of it? 
Oh, I don't know if I can talk you out of it, uh, but I, I'm nevertheless more optimistic on pro making progress. Okay. Uh, and your comments are great because they prompt getting back to, I mentioned there's a sort of a simple and a hard story about replication. Okay. And this example kind of prompts that hard story, which is any replication, we'll, we'll focus on social priming uh, since that's where, where we're talking now. Uh, any single replication does not demonstrate that a particular idea is true or false, just like any original study does. Because the ideas are always more abstract and general yep. than any one particular experimental paradigm does. So priming as an illustration is, I can argue with evidence that priming is a highly reliable replicable phenomenon. Uh, because it is. Uh, so when I say bread, you're much more likely and much faster at identifying a word as butter than a word that's unrelated to bread. The semantic relation between bread and butter uh, makes it easier, facilitates the processing of the subsequent word or when it's ambiguous, you know, making that interpretation. That's a super reliable phenomenon. Uh, and there's even steps away from that direct semantic connection of evaluative connections that's highly reliable. I give you a prime of something that you like, a sunny day, and if it primes positive affect, you'll be faster at processing other things that are positive compared to things that are negative. Uh, there's that, that has some leakage. So those happen on the scale of milliseconds and are very small and some fashion kinds of inf influences between the primes and their outcomes. That's one tradition in the priming literature that is robust, has matured, and in the community of scientists, you might say is uh, at the micro level. That, right. that tradition in the priming literature is Let's go deeper and deeper and deeper and figure out and unpack exactly the methodology that's making this work. Uh, and so it's high, there's tons and tons of replication, there's paradigm building, there's like, let's tweak it this way and that way. My colleague Tony Greenwald was trying to push the limits on how much uh, this can happen unconsciously. And so presenting those primes more and more briefly and he even found that it's not even full words that are being processed, it's portions of words, and you can stick two words that have been come to mind that say both have positive meaning, but you take parts of those words that have negative meaning, put them together, and then the prime still serves as a positive prime because of the earlier positive, I mean, all kinds of weird stuff, but it's really getting down in the methodology. The other, tradition, I'm oversimplifying all of this, of course, but the other approach was go big. Like, whoa, this primes that. What else can pr things prime? What kind of is the next cr a most amazing thing that could be primed? Yeah. And that's where the walking, then, you know, a prime of a single exposure to an American flag, eight months later, making people more likely to vote Republican than Democrat. I, the the outside of the box uh, example we talked about earlier. So those did drift apart and they became in some ways insular communities studying similar things. Uh, citations didn't cross the boundary very much uh, and the community of researchers sort of started to form their own subgroups. Even at the, these conferences, you wouldn't have these two groups necessarily uh, presenting at the same uh, pre-conference meetings in the same symposia. And so that is, that is, I think, on the discouraging side of what you're describing, is that, that camps, like everywhere else, can kind of emerge and you get sort of like, this is kind of what we do. And we are self-reinforcing because we're all kind of in this boat together of believing the, in these phenomena and trying to understand and unpack them in ways. And sometimes it requires some intervention from the outside uh, in some nominal way, right, that, uh, that really gets the, some of the fundamental assumptions to be questioned within that particular area. Well, you, I think what you want to maybe find is some way in which they conflict, right? 
so that you can, yeah. it, or some something that they disagree on, so you can figure out who's got the better, you know, I don't know, tool for the job, yeah. or you know, you want to resolve that separation. I, I, I've been recently kind of looking into um, theories of motivation, and so there's two, there's several schools of this, but two of them that I've researched most deeply are self-determination theory, and then yeah. another one's called self-efficacy theory, right? Alfred, Albert Bandura, and then Rich Ryan and um, uh, Ed DC. DC, yeah. Ed DC, yeah. And um, there's a there's even a paper that compares different theories of motivation out there, which yeah. I read, but it doesn't. It just sort of has a chart, and it says here's some things that are similar amongst them. Yeah. And in your yeah. in your we're in this together paper, you had this connectedpapers.com website, which I was messing around. I was researching for this. I was like, I wonder how these guys shape up in it. And man, it's like different galaxies. Like yes, Brian, they're talking about the same bloody thing. Right. <laughs> like, right. Well, you gotta be kidding me. Like how, right. what? What? And there's one reference, and I forget which one referenced which twice and one of them referenced the other one once and like the the big you know i got it right here the big thick book that has everything in it right you know yeah. hundreds of it's, it's like there's no, how, how do you how do you fix that you just gotta yeah. you, what do you do right no yeah this is a big problem and the you know in the the meta problem is that the reward system encourages researchers to have their theoretical position, their point of view, their theory that accounts for some things in the world. Uh, and so saying I'm working on somebody else's, well, that's, that, yeah, that's pretty weak, right? You're, you're yeah, a general yeah. scientist, right? If you have to work on somebody else's theory. It's funny, that's not true in a lot of other disciplines, right? No one says, oh, I'm working on Einstein's theory. What a, what a chump <laughs> I am. Uh, right. Yes. But in areas perhaps that don't have a stronger, and this is speculative, a stronger basis of knowledge that we are collectively building from, uh, perhaps then, you know, there's even more incentive for individual researchers to claim some space. Mm -hmm. I'm the motivation guy. And so I'm going to, my account is the account of motivation. And there is not much incentive for two different motivation groups to really work on resolving how their points of view are similar or different. A lot of the de debates happen. So plenty of debates happen in motivation and other types of theories where you're like, man, they're studying the same thing. Why don't they work closer together? Debates happen, but they happen as pot shots, right? Yeah. You, you have your sure. uh, catapult. Like a tape, like a rapper. Yeah, you're just <laughs> them as far away as possible and just right. trying to destroy them from a distance without actually engaging them in hand-to-hand -hand yeah. combat. Right. Um, and that obviously doesn't resolve anything because they just sort of drift along uh, in parallel. Uh, so one of the things that is, to me, really interesting, and the best example uh, that's happened recently is from the Templeton World Charity Foundation, uh, is that they decide, you know, there's these six or eight prominent theories of consciousness they're a funder that cares a lot about consciousness research and wants to form progress. And they're, they, they sort of observe the exact same thing you did uh, with motivation researchers. None of, these, none of these folks are talking to each other. What's up? Like, do any of these theories make different predictions? Do they have a different way of accounting for the phenomena? Are there, is there some way where we could line them up and say, oh, if this occurred, that would support this theory over that theory? Like, right. how are we going to make any progress? So what they did was they organized a series of meetings between camps, uh, as it were. Okay. Uh, and they would have two groups come together, and they say, you're here in the Bahamas, right? They bring them to the Bahamas where their office is, right? You're here, you're going to sit in this room for three days until you come up with critical experiments where your theories make different predictions. Interesting. Uh, and I, th I think... Uh, I, I'm not sure if this is right, but it's, they, they've done, they did this exercise like four different times, and once or twice they were able to get the teams to get to uh, experiments that differentiated predictions. Yeah. And not easily. Lots of yelling, <laughs> lots of fighting, lots of like, no, your theory says this. No, it doesn't, you idiot. You know, this, yeah. talking past each other, but, but confronted with this situation of we are here to design a an experimental context where we have different predictions really force them to confront, oh, do we have different expectations? 
And the times where it didn't successfully uh, conclude, uh, the program officer that I chatted with about this said that, you know, sometimes people just left the table. They just didn't want to. This was too ego challenging to confront. Right. And so they just, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, most impresses me, Brian, about the things that you've done is how much of just that kind of cat wrangling you've been able to do in your career. I mean, it's amazing the the two organizations you founded. I want. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on like how what what have you learned about getting people together to kind of work on problems. I mean, the number of co-authors on these like I mean, for that yeah. matter, number of teams involved. Forget the co-authorship. Like, how many different studies replicating, getting people together, getting them motivated to work on something the same thing, and you know, what have you learned about that? Yeah, you know, it's been a really interesting experience being involved in these large scale projects. Uh, on the one part of the answer is that what I learned early in trying to f form some of these uh, sort of col highly collaborative projects was that there were a lot of other people in the field that had similar interests and concerns as I did. Yep. Right? So this, this backroom conversation we talked about where you know, people are saying, oh, I don't know about this finding, everybody is having that kind of conversation about whatever is their area of interest. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. There were so many people that felt uh, like the culture was just different than where they were. The research culture was feeling like, okay, everything's fine, and we're finding more and more amazing things, and they're sitting there saying, what is going on here? Like, am I the only one that sees that we have this problem or that this finding probably doesn't replicate? Yep. And so just the act of saying, we're going to do this project. We're going to try to replicate some findings. You want to help? That was it. And dozens, ultimately hundreds of people said, yeah, I totally want to help with that because I'm really motivated. And the helping in the, for those projects was done entirely from a service motivation. There's nobody that joined these projects with 300 co-authors that thought, this is how I'm going to make my career. Yeah. Right? No, they're saying, I am passionate about this. I care about this problem. Finally, we can make some progress on it because the, we needed it to be a large-scale project, but no individual person or lab or group uh, could have possibly pulled it off. So we had to find this way to do it horizontally. Um, and so they see this. We might actually be able to make some progress. And so people jumped in and, and helped. So that part was great. The other side of it is in managing the conflict part. So, you know, wading into replication, particularly when it was not a common thing, uh, caused a lot of angst, uh, and reasonably so, right? We don't, we don't do organized replications in our field. You're, you're emailing me, Brian, saying you want to replicate my work. The only interpretation I can reasonably have of that is that you don't trust me, yeah, and sure. you're trying to take me down, and you're attacking me. Like, that is a reasonable interpretation when, the, when replication is not a common thing. Now that it's been normalized in some fields, peop, I mean, people still don't like getting email from me, but they respond to like, oh, okay, yeah, this is, this is a thing, you know, and fine, here's the materials, and good luck to you, you jerk. And, uh, but it's much more, you know, collegial kind of you jerk rather than right. the original responses. Um, and so part of it was just shifting the norms, but the thing that, uh, for me, uh, in entering that and that we developed as a strategy uh, for doing these projects is really going every, living, practicing the values that we were trying to bring to science to the maximum extent that we possibly could, right? Instead of entering something and behaving according to the existing standards, we would approach people and say, here's our project design. It's all public. Go check it out. You can see what we're doing. Here's what we're asking for. If you want to get involved, if you want to critique it in advance, we welcome that. Uh, here, you know, once we had the design, you don't have to do anything, but here is our design. If you want to look at it and give any critique, tell us how we might do it better. We'd love whatever feedback. Uh, so being fully transparent right from the outset, having high accountability standards for ourselves, 
giving original researchers as much opportunity to weigh in and, and comment on uh, the designs as, as much as we could. All of that, I think, paid dividends because that default stance of replication is an attack uh, had could not have been unseated, I think, without some community of practice that really worked on shifting the social part of that as much as the evidence part. I mean, and, you're leading to my next question, actually, perfectly, which I don't know much, like Randall Collins, you've read, but he's got this book, The Sociology of Philosophies, where he talks about, hmm. the sociologist talks about how uh, schools of thought movements aren't just kind of happening from nowhere. I mean, he documents a whole bunch of circles of people that got together and then they hung out and they sort of developed this this conceptual framework approach to the world. There's tons of them. I mean, every major school, I thought we're talking like thousands of years of history that he surveyed here. It's a movement. It's a social, social phenomenon. So yeah. he's saying philosophies right. are a social thing, which is super interesting. And your point there is, I think, one he would agree with, which is it's, it takes a whole bunch of people, it takes a, a yeah. village to kind of move the needle philosophically for a community. They got to be yeah. excited about it. And, you know, this isn't the first time you've kind of created a community like this, but I mean, holy cow, has it worked? What I'm interested in is like, like physically, like how did you get the first few people in the tent and you realize this is how we're going to do this? Or did you, did you try kind of replicating on your own first and, you know, it didn't work out and you're like, I gotta get some more people on board. Yeah. The, so, so I had an easy way to start, which was I had a lab with grad students and okay. I'm in charge. I get to say, this is what we're doing. I hope that I did that in a way that was positive, effective leadership and inspiring interest in these rather than commanding. But uh, nevertheless, that's what worked was uh, we had, uh, I started a project implicit in graduate school, measuring Im implicit biases for social social categories. And you can go to the uh, our website, implicit.harvard.edu and measure your own biases. Uh, that work was very useful uh, in creating an opportunity to conduct replications very efficiently as a side impact because the, po the website got very popular. So we had thousands of people coming every week to do these tests. Uh, and we started a research site on the side. And what we ended up starting to do just as standard practice uh, in the lab was when we saw something interesting in our area of research in the publication it published, we would first run a replication, just say, oh, let's make sure we can get it in our web format, because they you almost always showed in the lab. Web research wasn't that common. Mm. And, uh, and because participants were cheap, right? We didn't have to do this cost analysis that others did, which is, am I really going to replicate my own finding when I only have this much access to data? Uh, I should really try to do something new. We said, well, we'll just run it again, uh, make sure we can get it, and then we'll tweak it and vary it for the new question that we wanted to investigate. And uh, and this is, you know, early 2000s, mid-2000s, and over and over and over again, we would fail to replicate. Now, at that time, we included had the ambiguity, uh, in ambiguous interpretation of, oh, well, maybe this just doesn't work on the Internet. Yeah, uh, right. Right, maybe it's because they did in the lab. We're on the internet. I don't know. So while I didn't think that was very plausible, because I've been able to find all kinds of other things on the internet very similar, uh, it nevertheless was a barrier to broader change. But we started to accumulate that experience, experience, and it accumulated so much so that it ended up that I had designed a couple of experiments. Uh, where we did the exact same uh, studies uh, through our web infrastructure and in the lab through the web infrastructure and with lab participants through the Internet. <laughs> so they would, uh, you know, go and go, come to the lab and still do it through, the, uh, through our web infrastructure. So we're saying, we're going to really figure this out. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, we showed that the effects occur in all the places for that study, but that design actually became the thing that we transported then to be one of these large replication projects where we said, oh, it's not just our web versus lab thing. It's all of this explanation that researchers have about 
why effects don't occur when you change from Iowa to Indiana and then from Indiana to Ohio. Like, of course, those, they're totally different. Midwesterners in different parts of the Midwest are just different people, so of course you don't replicate findings. And we're saying, well, wait a second. Is the, do we really, can we really default to that kind of explanation? And so the, that, I, this is a long way around to what your question was, which was we sort of built up slowly that initial base. The first was we're just doing this as a lab work, and then we start to talk to collaborators on the same thing and say, oh, yeah, we're interested in this. And then the real opening was saying, why don't we just make public what we're doing? And then that's when people just came out of the woodwork. Dozens of people, literally within a few days, does I, we posted a thing saying we're going to try this big replication project. Um, anybody want to help us out? And within days, it, we were up to like 75 people. I'm like, oh, okay. That's so cool. We can really do this. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. What's amazing to me about that, I love that story, because the first thing you did was made replication cheaper. Yeah. started with, right? Oh, yeah. So it right. was through course software, and you have a software background right, uh, yep. college, which kind of kicked all that off. Um, and once it's cheaper, you can do more of it. Right. Classic software economics. Um, right. That's pretty cool. Nicely done. Uh, so I, I think that replication is a pretty fascinating thing. We've been using that word a lot. One of the things that surprised me too, reviewing some of the work you've done is that uh, the word replication contains some multitudes a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> find replication for me uh, and talk a bit about kind of your strategy for replicate. Repli uh, replicating studies um, yeah. and, you know, what some strengths, weaknesses of different methods are. Yeah. So the, the term replication is itself a source of debate, both in <laughs> what is a replication and then how do you interpret the outcomes of a replication. For me, the simplest definition of a replication is testing the same question using different data. Okay. Um, so this would not be what is sometimes called replication, but we, we would say is called reproduction, uh, which is using the same data over again, just to see if you apply the same analysis to the same data, do you get the same result, right? That should occur 100% of the time, right? You have the same data, you're doing the same analysis, the same outcome should occur. That That's, unless metaphysics is, well. <laughs> we're, okay, we're, okay, we're not going down that path. All right, <laughs> so I'm going to assume 100% that uh, reproducibility should be achievable. One step away from it is we might make different decisions in how we would analyze that data. It's the same data, but there's all kinds of idiosyncrasies in deciding how to deal with outliers, if there's transformation rules, there's always decisions yes. to make in that analysis. Right. Um, so that would be testing robustness. We're going to apply different decision rules that are reasonable. How, how likely is that result to remain across those decision rules? And then replication going the furthest is let's get some new data and try to apply uh, the same, uh, try to test the same question in a new context. Where there, be, where there gets to be a lot of debate uh, is, is what does it mean to test the same question? Do I have to use the identical methodology? Do I have to use, if I find a problem in the methodology, do I improve the methodology? Am I then testing the same question? And then if I talk about it in terms of a question, which is what we advocate, like testing the same idea, then it's no longer about the rote experimental context. It's really about the conceptual question. So our argument for what about replication is that it's saying that something is a replication is a theoretical commitment. It's saying, I think, given what we understand about the world, everything that I know about this experiment should be anticipated by that prior experiment and what we saw in the results. So I should get the same kind of result in this new context, regardless of what has changed, because any new data, is something uh, will have changed. And one of the things that you contend with, I think, in that last form, which probably is the most powerful, I think, because you should be able to change some things that don't matter and kind of come up with the same, if the thing's true enough, right, it doesn't matter if I'm looking at the sun from the moon or the earth, I'm gonna get the similar gravitational measurements or I don't know what the right way of right. translating that into a different domain is gonna be, it's still just gravity, 
right? Right. Um, from a different perspective with a different experiment. Um, I think that you know, the thing that kind of always I wrestle with when I think about this stuff is just how complicated people are and you know, right. studying psychology here, right? So you got to narrow the thing down to something really super tiny in order to be able to, you know, actually attack the same question. It does, you know, back to this kind of point about the different schools of thought of things, like it's almost like all things come almost can be true <laughs> um, because of how complicated you're going to always say, oh, well, I'm doing something ever so slightly uh, right. different, you know. Talk me through how and whether you can actually kind of achieve that deeper source of insight in a, in a replication process or, or what you might call that. Yeah, it, it, this is, it's a really interesting problem to unpack because I think you know, all, you know, what we're trying to do, obvi obviously, in science is develop explanations that predict and account for the regularities that happen in the world. Uh, and replication, I think, is because of the complexity you describe, which is lots of variables are there and they might be influencing each other in unexpected ways. Replication becomes a way to really get theories from being vague and general to much more precise and clarifying the boundary conditions of when these kinds of phenomena will and won't be observed. So what always happens in research, including my own papers, is that we will do some experiments and we will offer an explanation that is invariably more general than what the experimental context was. Right. right? Yeah. We, we set up this situation where we give people this kind of thing and they make this kind of judgment and then we say we have a more general account about how the world works. But someone says, okay, well, if I twist this and twist that, I don't see what you saw. I said, oh, well, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean exactly that, right? So now I have to qualify uh, my theoretical account to take, it, take into account this uh, place where it doesn't occur. But that's really where replication is productively confrontational to our ideas. We have a more general explanation. And what I should be able to commit to if I'm really trying to advance my theory is that when you present me with a design, Ideally, I don't know what the results are yet to be to rationalize my way into the, why those outcomes should have occurred the way they did. But you present me with a design, I should be able to commit to what you will find. Will that reproduce like what we saw before, or will it not? Or is it in a in a zone where I can recognize my theory isn't mature enough yet to predict? And if it's in the last c category in the ambiguous zone, I don't know if it's going to work in the situation you're setting up, then that's not a replication test. It's a generalizability test. Right. Replication is very clear expectations. This is what my theory anticipates. This is what should occur. Generalizability tests are, boy, the world's complicated, and there's lots of other variables, and theory isn't well specified there. So let's try it out. I'm totally curious to see if it happens in your context. Oh, it doesn't? OK, boundary condition. Yep. It wasn't qualified my, theore my theory yet because I didn't have expectations, except that now it sort of rules out some area of potential explanation. But also doesn't threaten my position on the theory because it didn't directly challenge core evidence. Where replication, if you had done it and I agree in advance, yep, that's testing the same question, a failure to replicate demands some updating. I may still figure out after the fact, oh, this is why it didn't, or, you know, per chance there's all kinds of reasons I might end up preserving uh, my original expectation. But I need to be confronted by that in a different way, to take seriously that, ah, I had an expectation and it didn't occur the way that I thought it would. Uh, I'm wondering, so I, I want to touch on implicit bias for a minute. And the way I want to kind of, uh, kind of move into that is maybe you can talk a bit about because the, the amazing thing, so the, the website, Project Implicit, I went on the website, I did some tests for myself, it was fun, uh, oh, interesting. Uh, so contributing a little bit there uh, to your efforts. Um, I think that the best way to probably hit this is maybe you could describe a little bit about what that does. But the, what I'm interested in is kind of how you use this ability to turn on a dime, because it's software, you can just sort of spin up a new test to sort of follow your learning journey, to like, test yeah. the boundaries of the idea. Um, because like the process is what enables you to hopefully have learned more about the underlying phenomenon than you otherwise would have been able to do. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, so the uh, the 
There are a variety of different way, methodologies we have used, but the primary one, the implicit association test, is the featured test on the uh, website, and you can use it to measure association strengths for a variety of different concepts. So the, the basic idea for those that haven't experienced it is take a deck of cards and instead of four suits, have four different categories. You can have uh, male faces and female faces and then words representing science and words representing humanities. And the, the participant then takes that deck of cards, shuffles it up, and has to sort them out into two piles. And they have to do it twice. First time is they sort all of the male faces and science words into one pile and all the female faces and humanities words into another pile. And they just sort as fast as they can. And I'm sitting there with a stopwatch figuring out how fast can you sort that deck of cards. Then you shuffle them up again, and now you have to sort them again, but the, with categories changed. Now I have to put the female faces in the science words in one pile and the male faces in humanities words in the other pile. And you can anticipate uh, what we observe in comparing how long it takes to sort in these two conditions. It's easier for people, regardless of their conscious beliefs, and people, I'd say, you know, 80% of respondents find it easier to sort male faces and science words together compared to female faces and science words. And the interpretation is a straightforward one. If those concepts are more associated in our memories, it should be easier to do the same action, put the male faces and science words into a, the same pile, go left, uh, than if those things are not associated in our memory. Harder to put female faces and science things together. So the base concept there of how the methodology tries to assess associations has a strong evidence base in the literature of other kinds of methodologies that measure strength of association. But it also has a unique application and then all kinds of different things that could be done with it. Oh, let's trade out the gender faces and put in race, uh, faces of different races. Let's change out the science and humanities words and put in terms meaning good or bad or myself or other people or other things. So you can start to really vary it. But one of the things that we were able to do because of the website engaging lots of interest was really zero in on lots of interesting debates on how the methodology was actually working and how we can refine the methodology to really try to isolate the substantive content of interest. Because this, the test evokes surprise in respondents, myself especially, uh, doing each of the tests on the website. I would always test it on myself first. Of, oh, I have this bias now too. This one works, okay, and then let's, let's see what other people react to it. Um, and it can evoke reactants because it can be different than what our conscious beliefs or values are. I don't, I don't want to associate men or women differently with science. I think everybody that's interested in science should go into science. I don't want to associate black and white people differently with positivity. I value everybody. I, I don't want that. So why would it be coming out of my head? So that response has been very useful in engaging the research community and the public with methodology. Well, if it's not about race or about gender, then what about the methodology might have produced it? Yeah. And then let's test that. Right. So maybe it's the order. Oh, you just told me you had to sort all of these male faces and science words together first. Maybe if I did the female faces and science faces first, maybe I would have been faster on that because you practice doing one thing and it's hard to unpractice that. Do that thing. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, with gender has to do with the method. Uh, so we would, uh, dozens and dozens of experiments testing all kinds of different variations uh, of the methodology, some of which d do have an impact. It does matter which one you do first. Uh, but then we can refine the methodology to do as much as we can to eliminate uh, that effect. So the progressive nature of science has it's, and our experience with implicit measurement is a perfect illustration, is both expansive and contractive at the same time. So, you know, the initial demonstrations, oh my gosh, everybody has bias, and oh my gosh, this is going to have all of these implications in the world. Um, well, no, that's not quite right, because methodology actually says, eh, not here and not here, and maybe limited, more limited in this case. 
And then simultaneously, research is saying, oh, wow, here is this new way in which we see that these are related uh, to biases expressed in the world. Like there's a recent publication that takes some of the project implicit data uh, and uh, looks at the average level of bias in geographical units in the U.S. and finds that the average level of implicit race bias is associated with the number of slaves that were in that geographical unit in the 1860s. Like, that's, that's crazy. Uh, and maybe, it, maybe that would not be robust to other variations, you know, so I can't make any claim for its replicability yet. But the, the researchers that did it said, you know what, this, this might be helping us understand a little bit about the origins of these, that they, that they are fundamentally embedded in the culture, how we, how we get these implicit biases. They're communicated through the social culture that's immediately around us. And so some areas of the country that have a deeper history in these challenges may have those kinds of biases more embedded in their minds than in other places. I wandered a little bit away from what we were talking about. That's perfect because what that, what's fascinating about that, there's a, another paper I wanted to touch on which was uh, pretty stunning for me, uh, which I think, tie, I, I think I'm interpreting properly with your other comment because what you're saying is that there's a, let's say that there's, well, there's an implicit bias of which they've measured there. They didn't measure explicit bias in those areas, but you probably measure that too, and you might find some things that, c that are consistent with right. that. Um, right. And then you have this causal factor, which is a third thing, though, which is this history of slavery. And yeah. you put a paper out uh, a little while ago that talked about how the changing implicit bias is kind of hard to do. Changing yeah. explicit bias is even harder. And by the way, it doesn't matter whether you change the implicit <laughs> or the explicit, right? And so it's actually something else underneath all that. And so we're kind of yeah. like, you can get very distracted with this concept of implicit bias, but you know, saying you're keeping your eye on the ball for what behaviors and actions are actually happening in the world um, is something you might want to keep in mind. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And the this is one of the areas in which the application of implicit bias research went way out in front of the research evidence, right? Every, lots and lots of people have gone through implicit bias trainings of one sort or another at their school or, or corporate environment or wherever they work. Uh, and I, I can't say all, but I can say much of that is inert to actually changing behavior. Right. Um, and the reason I can say that with some confidence is that we've studied behavior change associated with these sorts of educations, and we haven't yet found uh, reliable ways in which uh, these sorts of training interventions have impact on notable behaviors. Right? And the, the, I give lots of lectures on this to educate about implicit bias, or at least I used to. And one of the most impactful ways I can explain it uh, to the audience that really, really wants just a simple training to then change the bias within an organization or other context is to say, I've been studying this since 1996. I still have implicit bias. It's like my full-time job to study it all day, all the time, and I still have it in my head. Like, you can't just take an hour session and say, oh, good, we're all done with that. Uh, so, so that's one challenge, is just the leap from, wow, this is really interesting, we want to study it, to, oh my god, this is a social problem that requires some intervention, and then pursuing that intervention without actually evaluating what impact it has. The second interesting part is that it's not at all clear, and this is what you were referring to in, the, from, in that paper, it's not at all clear that we need to change the implicit bias. Right? The, once we demonstrate that it happens, right, the obvious thing that people would say is, oh my god, we have that implicit bias, we don't want it, so let's change it. And the evidence that's accumulated in the basic literature to date says that's pretty hard. Uh, and even if we were thinking it's possible, there's a pragmatic element, which is, which implicit biases are you going to change? So, okay, we affected your race bias, now how about gender? Now how about sexual orientation? Now how about age? Now how about, you know, you can go on and on and on. We have biases about everything. Um, that's just part of how it is our minds operate and sort and distill information about the world. And sometimes they're consistent with our values and sometimes they aren't. So as a practical intervention, trying to change implicit biases is, may not be the right way to lead in terms of 
trying to meet our equity uh, goals that we have uh, for addressing bias in general. A more effective strategy may be to say, let's assume that people have bias, implicit or explicit, and help create systems that reduce the opportunity for those biases to be expressed, or if they are expressed, have systems that help us to detect it and then address it, right? Like lots of uh, parts of, uh, you know, different types of technologies in the world don't try to prevent the thing. They try to make sure they have good quality control uh, along the way. So examples of this are if we don't want race to influence someone's judgment in a particular context, can we remove information about race so that it doesn't affect judgment in that context? Now, of course, that ends up getting more complicated as you start to pull the strand of it and say, okay, well, I don't want race to influence judgment in this interview, so we could remove information about race uh, from the interview, have avatars and other things that disguise uh, the ethnic and racial identity of the person that I'm interviewing. But that doesn't address if I have a view that there's been some historical inequities between blacks and whites for being uh, candidates for that type of position that I can't address by just blinding myself. So how do I address historical inequities? So there's all kinds of interesting problems to, that get pulled on uh, as threads for how do we create structures that enforce or promote the equities that we desire, and then how do we address the decision-making processes that are Im always going to be imperfect that we bring to it uh, in that context. It, what's especially interesting, I mean, we're talking about forms of social engineering kind of here, right? So how do we create yeah. society that we want? In insurance, we deal with this all the time. That's in my business. Um, you know, how do you get people to buy insurance? Brian, you pass a law making it illegal not to. Yeah. That's the answer right. to the question. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe yeah. it's a little heavy handed, but it came up yeah. with and it's working yeah. and people don't like it, uh, but they do it anyway. I mean, keep electing governance to maintain insurance mandates of all kinds and enter into contracts right. with banks and all the rest of this kind of stuff, right? So. Um, right. There are ways of getting at this stuff, which is um, a little more direct. Um, but the irony of this is, as you pointed out, the practice of, let's say, taking the ideas of implicit bias and running with them um, is that, you know, you actually think it's not quite so influential um, uh, being somebody who is very early in researching this and very prominent in its promulgation. Um, you actually think it's a little overrated, <laughs> it seems, implicit bias. Yeah, I think it's it's more modest that for sure that it's in between the the, the advocates and the critics, I guess, if, <laughs> yeah, if you're sure. right. Right. There there yeah, are right. there was a fellow that at Yale Law School when we were first doing this work that said, you know, what I want to do is I want to have police officers go out, take an IAT every morning, and then have their score on their badge when they go out that day. <laughs> To, for work so everyone could see what their bias was that day. And he was kind of joking, but kind of not. Uh, and so, yeah, that's the, there are um, in these exuberant reactions to thinking about how is it that we could apply this basic concept into uh, managing our social realities. And it's not that I think that none of them apply. It's that I think there is uh, that any extension or application of how implicit bias might be having an impact in some context and then how we might address that impact in that context has to be accompanied by evaluation, by assessing whether implicit bias actually is having an impact, right? Can we cre create some assessment to understand what are the, the factors that are influencing this particular behavior? And then whatever intervention we design, can we get evidence that it's um, actually impacting the, the judgment and getting us closer to what our, our goals are? And what's been stunning to me in experience uh, in this area of work is that there are very few, and it, near zero is not an exaggeration, uh, organizations that have the wherewithal to say we're actually going to assess and evaluate whether our changes an organizational practice address bias, implicit bias or not, just the biases that we might have in, in performance evaluation and succession planning and hiring, whatever it is. Uh, and of course, we could go outside of corporate context too. Um, but there's very little investment in 
actually assessing <laughs> the problem that they're, the, they're wanting to address. It feels like just lots and lots of window dressing. Uh, and, and not that it's, and I, that sounds too negative. It is, and I am negative about it, but I think the intentions are good. It's just based on hope. And you can't, you can't do it all just based on hope. I, I hope this works. Like Starbucks did that huge uh, intervention on implicit bias. And they, they're, the consultants that were designing that were calling me, and uh, I gave them whatever advice I could give and said, you know, the best thing that Starbucks could do here is evaluate it. Yeah. Do whatever intervention you want to try. The sure. best thing you could do is evaluate it. Because you have 3,000 stores, you're going to do it in every single store, you have a chance for randomization. You could demonstrate a causal impact that almost no one else could do by randomizing whether a store gets uh, the intervention or not. Just doing that will have a dramatic, even if you thought, see no effect, would have a dramatic effect on advancing this. But of course, they don't want to see no effect, right? That would hurt yeah. their, that would be a, a, a th existential threat, perhaps, organizationally. But I think that's the wrong way to think about it. Well, but, I mean, that, you know, that reintroduces, you know, and there is a course of theme in your career, which is the difference between what we want to do and what we do do, um, yeah. right? And, and uh, do -do. you're having yeah, yeah. quite a lot more success <laughs> on changing behavior on the rep reproducibility, um, yeah. replicability of studies. Um, maybe we can sort of close uh, on the topic of kind of what things are working for, for the replicability project and uh, yeah. kind of how you're advancing those. I think it's really exciting. Yeah, that it has been very exciting that it has n not been just a here's a problem and boy isn't it terrible that there is a problem. <laughs> um, it really has turned into a productive movement uh, by the community, and that community keeps spreading and growing. Right, we, we focused on psychology, my home discipline, but really, uh, it's happening everywhere across the sciences. Uh, we just in, in the within the past year published a replication project of cancer biology studies that showed very similar things as the psychology work ha wow. has done. Um, and so there's lots uh, of that happening across disciplinary fields. But the real great part is that interventions are occurring across the different parts of the research ecosystem that create that structure and system of rewards. So what my, my favorite is, is registered reports, uh, which is changing the publishing model, right? If we start with the insight that the, re the reward system for a scientist is to get your work published and get it published in the most prestigious outlet that you possibly can and then publish as frequently as you can, uh, then we recognize that's a focal point, right? Publication is the currency of advancement. So what does it take to get published? Well, it takes exciting, sexy findings uh, to get published in those uh, prestigious outlets. And that's, if you sort of work through the process, that's the core problem that produces all of these biases of ignoring negative results, of exaggerating findings, of reanalyzing the data until it looks publishable, et cetera, et cetera. So registered reports goes after the key challenge in that, which is, Let's change the way that publication decisions are made at journals from what you do now, which is do all your research, write your report, send it to the journal, and hope the reviewers don't find enough wrong with it to reject it, which they almost always do, but eventually I can get it through that. And the register report model says, okay, no, that's not how we're going to do it. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to clarify your research question do some preliminary work to make sure your methodology is viable, maybe, and then write out your methodology of what you're going to do. And you send that to the journal. And the reviewers, instead of evaluating, did you produce exciting outcomes, they evaluate, did you ask an are you going to ask an important question, and is your methodology an effective test of that question? Brilliant. And then they give, if it passes those criteria, they give in principle acceptance. This journal commits to publishing what you do as long as you follow through with what you said you were going to do, regardless of the outcomes. So just that simple change fundamentally changes the reward system for me, the author. Instead of having to produce exciting results to get my reward, I have to ask important questions 
and design really effective tests of those questions. That's exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. So we've aligned the reward system with what we want scientists, I hope the collective we, what we want scientists to do. And then the results are the results. The evidence, we have now 350 or so journals have adopted registered reports as a publishing option. And the early evidence suggests that it basically entirely removes publication bias. Instead of 90% positive result rate, uh, the er journals that the early findings found about 40% positive result rate. We're publishing lots and lots more negative results. And independent evaluations of the methodology and papers find that they're more rigorous, higher quality papers compared to similar papers written by the same authors or published in the same journal. So we may be getting both more credible evidence and more rigorous research through this uh, mechanism. So it's one of a variety of different things, but to me, one of the most important interventions to really change the system in the fundamental way. That's pretty cool. That's more than pretty cool. It reminds me of the venture capital kind of model. You know, we're going to fund an idea and see if it works out um, yeah. with the additional layer of actually informing everybody about what happened. Uh, yes. Because, you know, people don't. That's the key. Yeah. Right. Right. There's science. You know, a lot of there's a lot of misunderstanding in the replication debates and in this part of it, which is fear of error or mistake or failure. Yeah. And that's crazy in any field that's pushing the boundaries, right? Science and venture capital are both. They're pushing the boundaries on what's possible. So there's, if you're doing it right, there's going to be false starts all the time, all the time. Like lots is going to fail because we don't know. We have to try it. <laughs> so the way that the reward system in science saying only report your successes then necessarily creates an exaggerated misguided sense of what the reality is and just ends up creating all kinds of friction in the process that's unnecessary. If we can show the error and the failure and not have it be that, oh, Brian, you were wrong about that idea as some cost to my career, but, wow, you really designed an interesting test of that idea. Yeah, it, it didn't work out, but now we know that that is a, not a viable path. We would be so much healthier as a discipline if we could adopt that as a mindset. So what's surprise so I mean what you're talking about here is uh well you mentioned it's an option. So it's not like they're going whole hog into this uh yet. Um but you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But we're talking about changing the culture pretty dramatically uh in prop in, yeah. in journals from one of sensational findings to sensational mm -hmm. process. And you can maybe talk about the score framework that you've developed as well. But um, what are your chances of actually really moving the cultural needle at journals? I mean, that's a pretty big, ambitious project. Yeah, n none of these things happen quickly, and nor, nor should they even, right? This model, while I express it in glowing terms, right, just like we talked about earlier, I'm going to perceive this as more globally applicable and effective as a solution than the ultimate evidence will reveal. So if we don't have, which... Luckily, the, this change movement in science is accompanied by a meta-science movement that is simultaneously evaluating the impact of all of these changes. Um, but that will be really important for making sure that these interventions are implemented appropriately, are maximized in effectiveness, and that we identify the boundary conditions of where they are limited. So, for example, it may be that this registered reports model creates a lot of conservatism in what questions people ask. Right? If you have to agree in advance to publish my crazy idea, you're going to evaluate it. No, that's, that's crazy. There's no way that's going to happen. Why would I commit to publishing yeah. that craziness? Um, so maybe I won't take risks there. So we can imagine lots of plausible scenarios where, okay, it's appropriate for this kind of work and not that kind of work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, so the growth path is nonlinear. Right? Every year we have more journals signing up for registered reports than had offered it the prior year. But in a, also in a way that allows us to manage the adoption and evaluation process in concert. So it started in social behavioral sciences, is active in neuroscience now, is starting to move into other areas of research with more journals adopting. 
we can see that how does this work for bench uh, related science uh, you know what hap what comes up uh, in computational approaches to trying to adopt this model can we even apply it to qualitative research oh that's an interesting possibility you know, so it's that kind of stuff of investigating how do we optimize the product uh, for to be fit for purpose for different types of research is a key part of effective scalable sustainable adoption and then the other part, you, you called out SCORE, is that it's coming along at the same time that there are other interventions that collectively are contributing to improving research practice. So sharing data, materials, and code is becoming more normative. There's lots of repositories. Our open science framework is one of many uh, that offer tools for that. Pre-registration, making the, calling your shots uh, in advance, committing to identifying studies has been gaining popularity uh, across different disciplines, particularly social behavioral sciences. And then the projects like SCORE, which we're just wrapping up as a DARPA-funded project, is looking at can we also improve the, on the assessment side? So we can improve the rigor with all of these new practices, practices to try to make sure that the pipeline is effective as possible. But it'd be really useful to be able to evaluate the outputs more effectively and efficiently. And so the goal of SCORE is to create automatic indicators of confidence in research claims. So wouldn't it be useful if we could get an initial read of how much we can trust this particular piece of evidence? Uh, based on uh, its connection to the existing literature, based on other cues in the, in the, the evidence itself. And so that's really been the, the problem that we've been pushing on uh, for the last three years. Uh, and we have some preliminary evidence that's enough to sort of start to transition from pure research into research and development, that there may be some uh, effective scoring that is, that is a complement to the human peer review processes that we apply to research findings to help direct our attention to those areas of the research where there may be a little bit more cautious about or more confident in to justify further investment of time or resources or attention. Uh, so uh, one more question, actually, and we can close. But, uh, yeah. you know, you've actually published a little bit about uh, open, uh, you know, publishing preprints, postprints. Um, there's free repositories, there's archive, uh, and, and sci archive, I think it is. Um, yeah. these are outside the journal. Um, I only read free versions of things cause I don't have access what? to Elsevier or what things called. Um, right. is that good enough to learn from? I know, I know it's outside of the, um, the, the kind of the culture of academia kind of that stuff, but is it, does that work too? Being able to read these yeah. things in different standards? It does. Um, at this point, and I, I haven't seen the, the latest, but there's something like 70% of the literature is now publicly accessible. Yeah. Uh, and that's a, a great improvement over the last 20 years. The, uh, the community of open access advocates have been really, really effective at uh, developing an understanding that more open accessibility of the research outputs, the reports, uh, is important for society that it's, it's easy to justify as the public paid for a lot of this. Shouldn't the public be able to access it? Yeah. Uh, that the business models uh, for publishing are based on paper and they just make no sense uh, in a, a digital world anymore. Uh, and as a consequence, we create up these artificial, unnecessary barriers and added costs uh, to accessing the literature. So preprints and open access more generally are becoming normative across different disciplines. Physics has been doing it for since 1991 uh, with Archive, uh, and the rest of the research communities are, ca are catching up. Uh, and that, that's a very productive for democratic interests, just making the research more accessible, particularly for areas of the world uh, that could be contributing substantially to science, but can't access the actual literature, uh, and then the application, people who are reading the science, like you, uh, who want to translate it, apply it, or do something with it uh, to better the world. Um, but it isn't enough to solve the uh, dysfunctional reward system, and that's the other part of it. So it's a complement to that. It addresses other challenges for the use of research, but it doesn't itself make the research more trustworthy, and that's really for, for us the, a core uh, focus area is 
let's not just make it available. Let's make it so that you can use it and use it with confidence. Okay, so we'll close there. Where can people help you? Brian, tell us where to find the, uh, the project websites. How can people sign up to take these surveys or if they're academics to pitch in? Yeah, the Center for Open Science, its general website is cos.io. Uh, that is, shows a range of services, registered reports being one, but then another, a number of others that are initiatives to try to shift the research culture. Our main infrastructure, the Open Science Framework, is at osf.io, and that's a free open source tool for researchers to enact these rigor and transparency behaviors in their own work. We have more than half a million users now. Uh, and then if you're interested in implicit bias, go to projectimplicit.net uh, or implicit.harvard.edu, and you can take tests or engage the uh, researchers that are advancing that work uh, to try to figure out how it actually works and how it actually behaves in reality and how, what we can or should do about it. Awesome. My guest today is Brian Nozick. Brian, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.